This video is brought to you by Skillshare, a place with thousands of different kinds of videos and learning courses for those creatives and people who are looking to learn a new skill. A myriad of different courses are available on Skillshare, everything from graphic design, photography, or personally something that I found rather interesting, UI design. User interface is particularly interesting because learning the different kinds of games UI, things like RTSs and FPSs, and seeing how they differentiate is not only quite interesting, but something that I was more interested in learning about. Therefore, Skillshare could help me out quite a bit. The whole site is entirely dedicated to learning, and for less than $10 a month, there is absolutely no ads to bug you while you're doing so. Not only that, but the first 1,000 people to click on the link in the description will get a free trial of the premium membership so you can all start learning as soon as possible. I would highly recommend giving it a shot. Find a topic that you think is particularly interesting and go start learning it today. Thank you very much for Skillshare for sponsoring this video and let's get in to the main video. Hello everybody, my name is Ricky, currently running from the law for not liking The Last of Us 2 on Twitter. And originally I had planned on doing the usual top five best games of the year style video. And then as time went on, as I was thinking about like mm, top five, maybe it's not necessarily the thing I wanna do. I don't really wanna narrow it down to be that small because there's a lot of games I wanna talk about that aren't just the best games, things like Riot's new LP or, you know, The Last of Us 2 or maybe something like Fall Guys, games that really surprised me this year and things that I didn't either expect or were disappointed by or were just kind of cute. So then I decided, okay, how about we do a games of 2020 thing? You just all the major influential games that I could do. But then, you know, Skillup did that and, you know, he did it probably a lot better than I would. And he's Australian and he's got like this just huge cock. And I'm like, I can't compete with that. How about this? Games in 2020 that are pretty good and perhaps flew under the radar. Even to this day, a video that keeps on getting views, to my surprise, is my Darkwood review. For some reason, that video is just blasting off, and it's insane to me. Maybe it's the catchy title, maybe it's just pacing time-wise, who knows? Who honestly knows? But regardless, Darkwood, as a game that I personally very, very much enjoy, is doing so well, and it was exciting to me because I was able to get a bunch of people to learn and try out a small Polish indie horror game. And so I thought, you know what, I could use these powers for evil, or I could use them for good, or you know, just tell you guys about some games that I liked. So with that, I've decided that I'm gonna talk about three specific games that came out in 2020. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on them as I would for some kind of major game of the year, which if you're curious what my game of the year is, it is in fact Hades. I fucking love Hades to death. It's amazing. But one thing that's important is that Hades did something different. It took the roguelite genre and it did a spin on it. A constant changing story, romances, uh, different kinds of customization, not only from the character, but even in the environment itself. It's actually a very impressive, well thought out and deep system in a game all about doing the same thing over and over again, which is why Hades stood out to me so much. The three games I'm talking about today are three games that take a pre-existing genre and change it up a little bit. Now, none of these games are necessarily gonna be like top 10 of the year, except for maybe one of them. It's not about that. It's about these new games that you may not have heard of, that you might thoroughly enjoy, regardless of them being in the best of the entire year. They're different, they take a spin on an old idea, and with that, I wanna talk about them. And the first one we are talking about today is an adorable, adorable little management sim called Spirit Fair. Spirit Fair is the intense emotional feeling of having a grin on your face so damn wide for 90% of a playthrough that when it finally snaps back due to a two minute monologue and a gut punch, it causes the next California earthquake. It's a hand-drawn, story-based management sim where you play as a young girl named Stella and your job is to take over Charon's business, Charon's Bowden business. 
Not that Charon, though that is a pretty cool Charon. Charon has made you the new spirit fair, and your job is to go through the land of the spirits, the land of the dead, so to speak. It's very cute for the land of the dead. On your big ass boat and go find these lost souls and lost spirits and shepherd them to the other side. These spirits all have their own little backstory. They all have a cute little animal variation of them, whether it's a deer or a frog or a snake. And these particular spirits are all troubled in some way. They have some kind of past. They have something that happened in their waking era. And that's one of the cool things about this game is that you have to kind of piece together, okay, these people are all dead. What happened to them? Why are they sad? And how can I make them happier? It, in a sense, it's almost like a survival game. Your entire meter, what would be hunger, sleep, and thirst is actually just happiness for the souls aboard your ship. You spend the entire game making sure that your crew is happy. You build them their own little house. Perhaps you build them a place where they can do something, like say a sawmill for good old Atul here, the frog, or maybe you make some kind of garden to allow you to grow some new crops. And during this entire time, you are managing this. Make sure your crops are watered, make sure your food is being prepared, and you can make all kinds of recipes that God damn, look really fucking good. Make sure your people are happy with mainly three things. The things they ask for, perhaps like a new area or house, food and food they like, and also the dedicated hug button. Yes, this game has a dedicated hug button and it is cute 99% of the time, except for that terrifying mushroom child. 99% of this game is cute, happy, adorable, until that 1% hits because you need to remember it. You need to remember that feeling of dread that is constantly washing over you. You are the spirit fair. Not only is everyone that you're helping already dead, but so are you. And that's the question. How did they die? How did you die? And more importantly, remind yourself that your job is to take them to the other side, to let their spirit pass on, which is the equivalent of killing them again. Every single person aboard your ship will not stay there forever. They will, after you've gotten them everything they need and you've made them the happiest soul possible, they will move on and they will be gone forever. All these people you are forced to get attached to will go away. And even more of a gut punch, you can't get rid of their house. Their little house will stay on your boat for the rest of the game as a constant reminder. The game really feels like it's telling the inevitability of, of death. People come and people will go and they will leave their mark and you have to live with it. No matter what, one spirit in this game will resonate with you. Whether it's Atul, who personally was one of the ones that really hit me pretty hard, or maybe Gustav the bird, or Alice, the little hedgehog. I don't, I don't really know what they technically are, but they, they will, uh, that's a rough one right there. And this is why Spiritfarer is so impressive because it's a management survival sim basically, but it's not for you. It's not to help you in a perilous environment. It's not food and water meters. Well, I mean, there's a food meter, but it's for everyone else. It's to make everyone else really happy. You are the most selfless goddamn individual of all time. Stella is an adorable, sweet young girl whose entire purpose is to shepherd everyone else to the other side, making them as happy as goddamn possible. And it even gives you benefits for doing so. You keep these people well-fed, hugs galore, they give you stuff too. A tool will give you some more like planks so they use as a sauce. So it will give you some rocks or some food. Hell, goddamn my main man Gustav plays the damn violin and makes sushi with his beak. He is a king. And it's this never-ending balancing act where you're constantly jumping between making sure your ship is always moving to a new location, finding stuff in the various islands of this big spirit realm, making sure that your crusher is being worked on and your sheep are fed, and also make sure that your garden is growing properly, and then you have your iron ingots that are currently smelting, and it's actually sometimes a little stressful because of how much you gotta handle at once, but it's such a good twist on this kind of game. It's the same reason why I like Hades so much. Hades is a, is a roguelite, but it's more than just a roguelite. It's taking a new step in the spirit fair does the exact same thing. If I had any negatives to say on this game, it's that I think that they're just a little bit too vague with a lot of the stories. Often you'll go and you'll get someone to their side and they'll tell you the little monologue and they'll talk to you about their story, but 
sometimes it's just a little bit too vague. You kind of have an idea. Like uh, somewhere the snake is always talking about a dragon and the dragon's always coming back and you think that they're fixing them, but you're not quite. And you kind of have to sort of understand what's going on, but it doesn't really perfectly give you it all spelt out. However, it is all spelt out in the digital art book for some goddamn reason. I don't really know why that's the case, but once you actually like look it up on the wiki, for instance, it makes total sense and it's completely understandable. And I don't know why there isn't a log or some kind of maybe transcript in game that tells you the full backstory. Even after you beat the game, it doesn't do that. So it's a little bit strange, um, though this is a game that I would not worry about checking the wiki, both in terms of materials, because often certain areas are gated off and let's say someone needs a new house and you don't know how to get that material and you can't tell, oh, did I just miss it? Or is it later on in the game and I just have to wait anyway? There's no shame in using the wiki for things like that. You want to know how to get aluminum ingots, you probably need to look it up and be like, uh, am I even there yet? Or did I miss it later? Because that's the thing that there's really no uh, shame in doing. But for the wiki, after a spirit has gone gone through, you could look up their backstory because I think it really adds a lot more to the character. And it also like helps you affirm if you were right on your suspicions. I was pretty clear on the backstory of Atul, but Summers confused the hell out of me for a bit. And when I looked it up, I was like, oh my God, it was so obvious. That really is my only major negative with it. Maybe it's a little bit too long, I'd argue as well, but overall it's, Adorable game. It does something different with the management and survival style gameplay, and it can be pretty, pretty tear jerking at times. So go into it expecting at least a couple emotional gut punches. Kentucky Route Zero. Kentucky Route Zero is easily my most difficult recommendation. It is either going to be a 10 out of 10 or a zero out of 10, depending on who you ask. It is going to be pretentious, boring bullshit to some, and a slow burn masterclass of storytelling to everyone else. This game is very polarizing and I'm having a hard time talking about it. This is probably the most niche game I have ever recommended on this channel. More than Darkwood, yes. Okay, so you play as a guy, his name is Conway, and you're like a delivery guy for an antique store. You got your little truck and you got a dog, this old, old dog with a hat, the, the bitchin' hat. And you're looking for an address called Five Dogwood Drive, and you can't seem to find it, so you ask this little guy at a gas station, and he says, hey, you gotta take the, the Route Zero, you gotta take Kentucky Route Zero, or just the Zero and you have a really hard time finding the zero. When you do find the zero, it's kind of weird and, and kind of mystical and strange and you don't really understand it very much and then weird things start happening and that's basically the game and I don't want to say much else because this is a weird fucking game. The difference between a slow burn and boring as hell is entirely dependent on the person who is watching or playing it. Uh, I really liked the movie, uh, like The Lighthouse, for instance, right? And I can see how someone would look at The Lighthouse as being boring, pretentious bullshit. Or, but you know, I, I like that kind of thing. I thought it was weird. And Kentucky Route Zero kind of gives me a little bit of a No Country for Old Men feel where it's kind of got this this weird feeling every time I play it. Like like a shortness of breath almost. Like it's very, it's very tight. It's very like, worrying, but it's not a horror game. It's just constantly got me on edge all the time for simple mundane tasks. Whether it's the surprisingly good, but kind of creepy ambient droning sounds uh, or lack of music, like No Country for Old Men, it has no music, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. I fucking love that movie. Like that film, there is no music and not, this game doesn't really have it. M most of the time there's a little spout of music, like a little old Yeehaw Kentucky style music, but then it becomes just this very loud droning ambience and then some strange like, Background noise that doesn't do it's a weird goddamn game. It's split into five acts and I did the first act and I 
was like, okay, it's kind of boring, but I'm a little bit intrigued. And then I did the second act and some things just start to kind of get at me. Like I was in the second act and there was an office building. And in this office building, I had to go up to the fifth floor or something like that. And I went up there or I was at the console and I was looking at it and I saw that floor three was bears. Okay, so I clicked on floor three and yeah, though, that those are bears. Shit, man, I barely get any work done around there. There is a charm to this game, and it may seem weird how I'm describing this one, but it just, it wouldn't leave my mind. Every time I played it, I was thinking to myself, ah, this is really slow and kind of boring. But then, after a few hours, I was thinking about the game again, and I tried turning it back on, because I was curious. I was kind of invested and freaked out, and then I would play it, and I'd be like, ah, oh, this is good, but it's kind of boring. And then I'd turn it off, and then I want to play it again. I don't know, it, it grabbed me in this weird hook, and I don't know how, and I don't know why, but there's something about it that gets with me. There's something about it that resonates, and I don't know how to describe it. If you want to brave this, if you want to try out this bizarre, very different style of narrative structured game, go ahead. It's up to you, you know, I'm, I'm warning you, it's a very weird game, but if you are going to try it, I'd say at least finish Act 2. Do act one and then finish act two. And if you fucking hate it, then you're okay. Cause it won't change much after that. You can go ahead and turn it off and never revisit it. If you don't and you end up actually really liking it, then good. I got you to try something different because it truly is a completely different method of both storytelling and gameplay creation that some would call pretentious, but I would call rather interesting. And lastly, we're gonna go the entire opposite direction. Hard Space Shipbreaker. I hate that name. I, I, I despise that name. Okay, Hard Space Shipbreaker. Just call it Shipbreaker, okay? Shipbreaker is perfect. That's all you need. Hard Shipbreaker, whatever. Just not Hard Space colon Shipbreaker. Now this game is early access. Now normally I don't like to recommend early access games. Uh, however, it feels pretty polished. And the last early access game I played was this fun little game called Hades. Shipbreaker is for people who love Truck Simulator. Well, uh, maybe not quite. They like the kind of, it's nothing like Truck Simulator, but it reminds me of Truck Simulator, okay? Your job is simple. You go out into space and you cut down ships. You are basically just a glorified zero G hauler uh, disposal guy. You have a ship, it's been declassified for whatever reason. So your job is to do the blue collar man work that you have and pay off your $1 billion of debt by working your entire ass off here. And there's a nice little bit of dystopianness to it as well. In the beginning, when you sign your contract on, there are some small little tidbits like, I promise to vote for this person in the next election and some other major contractual stuff. I one time overheated my cutter device and it blew up. And instead of the PA saying like, you know, are you injured? It said like, company property damaged. It kind of reminds me of the Outer Worlds a little bit. But your job is to relaxingly move your way through zero G and slice these ships apart and salvage everything in it. Sometimes it goes to the furnace, sometimes it goes to the processor or to the barge beneath you. And because you're in zero G, you have all the things that go along with being in a zero G environment. How you twist yourself, how you spin, you can twirl and move up and down the ship and all. Some of the ships are still pressurized in the cabin and all. So you gotta make sure you depressurize the cabin before you do any kind of major work or you'll face an explosive decompression. You use a cool little scanner to find all the structural integrity points of it so you can cut those up and pull out different parts of the ship. You have grapples and tethers to make it easier to move things that are very, very heavy. It's actually pretty cool. You gotta manage oxygen and it's a surprisingly relaxing, very just, like, like I said, blue collar truck simulator type of thing. Your job is just chilling, being a normal ass blue collar worker, getting your stuff done, cutting a ship apart, 
giving it to the places it needs to do and then you go back and have a nap still a billion dollars in debt and you wake up to keep making your debt not bad anymore it combines the three most american things i can think of southern accents debt and a dystopian future and it's pretty cool as this goes up and as you constantly cut up this particular ship it actually is impressive the amount of different things that you get from it in terms of skill tree upgrades because you do level up and you get harder and harder ships where it's not just about explosive decompression but it's also about removing a reactor and making sure it gets down to an area quickly before it melts down on you it's also about combining different tethers together and then sending it to certain areas to make your job not only easier but allow you to haul multiple things at once it's about upgrading your different equipment to hold more oxygen, to make it so that your cutter doesn't overheat as fast. It's got a surprisingly expansive skill tree for just slicing ships apart and throwing them around there. It is really the type of truck simulator kind of just relaxing, simple work game simulator that you would play if you like space. And it has the things that space has with it. You know, if you puncture your suit, you're in some big fucking trouble you better get that shit fixed you know you gotta learn how to twist and roll in zero g and break yourself and how you move around this whole environment to be able to cut out certain points and pull out different kinds of hole to throw into the processor it's i don't know man it's like about it it's just it's just kind of relaxing I don't know exactly how long people will enjoy this, and I don't even know if any of my fans would be the ones who enjoy it, as opposed to, you know, the millions of Euro Truck Simulator players that just do it for the sake of it, but I find it really damn cool, and I bet in VR, it would be even cooler. Besides the title, which I fucking hate, it's really fun. It's a very fun early access game, and I think if this is the kind of game for you, you can get a lot of mileage out of it. And there you go, everyone. Those are three games you may not have heard about in 2020. I didn't want to go too crazy. I didn't want to take too long on them. I mainly just wanted to give you the titles, give you a description, and tell you why I like them, and then let you go on your own thing. Um, happy 2021 to all of you. I hope that uh, this year is way better than last year, as I'm, I'm sure, I sure hope it is. Uh, but for me, I got lots of different plans ahead of me. Um, I want to do a review on the game Outer Wilds coming up next uh, because I played that twice already and it's an absolute blast and I want to talk about why I'd argue it's one of the best space games of all time. Yes, I legitimately believe that. And then from there, uh, no, that's, uh, that's really about it. I got more projects coming in, uh, some different stuff going on on the Twitch stream if you'd like to join me over at uh, twitch.tv slash bricky. And yeah, I don't have any questions for today as I'm kind of revamping a few things, but some of you may have noticed that underneath the this video, you could find like the join thing. Uh, I've turned on the memberships for YouTube. So if I got some like emotes and stuff that I use for my Twitch stream in there, these cute little pink bear beat stuff, I really like them. Uh, but if you're interested in joining this, I mean, it's totally up to you. I already have the Patreon and everything, but I thought I might as well add like the extra avenue if you want to have your name highlighted or like have your special emails or something in the comment section of these videos. It's mainly just there if you feel like it or if you don't want to give your money somewhere else. So, you know, it's kind of fun. And it's uh, I'm probably going to turn it on for this and the um, Big Brick Plays channel as well because, I don't know, you know, it's it's, oh, it's always good to have your uh, self diversified in terms of income. So that's a lesson you got to learn, by the way. Never put all your fingers in one pie. Make sure you have your fingers in multiple pies until the person at the bakery kicks you out. So, yeah. All right. You have a good one, everyone.